So we're on to my second part of the talk, and that is now is I'm going to talk a little bit more about the interventions, what we've just been talking about. What do we do with temperature management? How do we achieve our goals? You know, so same disclaimers. So, you know, just a quick reminder that how do we regulate heat? You know, typically, well, we basically have four things that we do. We have radiation, which is the emission of the electromagnetic radiation um, from like a fire, something hot. We have evaporation or the um, cooling as the, we get rid of water. We have uh, conduction, which is where we have the direct transfer of, of heat or cold from the contact. And then we have the um, convection, which is from the moving air. So that radiates from the radiating of heat. So first thing I want to talk about is what, what do we know, what do we do with uh, fever? So, you know, we've been listening back and forth about fever or hypothermia. So the first thing we're going to do is use antipyretics. And if you look at the literature now, they basically say, you know, they used to have aspirin in there, that's gone. So it's acetaminophen, and we should be aggressive in giving enough acetaminophen, four grams a day, or ibuprofen. And in fact, the literature suggests that really the combination of those two is more effective in, in treating fever. The effectiveness of these treatments, our antipyretics, is dependent on an intact thermoregulation. So that means that hypothalamus needs to be working, not the injured hypothalamus. So the other thing that we do is if there's an infection, we're going to treat that infection. If there is DVT or if there is a drug that is causing it, we're going to take, you know, treat those things appropriately. We may stop the medication, change the medication, if that's what we think is the offending agent. And then there are some um, agents that have been suggested for central fever that are better than, so giving a patient Tylenol or acetaminophen or uh, ibuprofen, if we determine that this is a central or neurogenic fever, is not gonna help you. So the drugs that we've, we've seen that work are anti-inflammatories or either along the catecholamine um, route. So indomethacin, bromocryptine, amantadine, those are all Parkinson drugs, um, and um, propranolol. The other things that we're gonna do are a variety of other cooling methods. So the first thing we can look at is surface cooling. And you guys have seen most of these. You know, we've removed the blanket, we have tepid sponge baths, ice packs. Now, I have to say, it's been very interesting. When I go to Africa, they have very limited resources. So I have to go back to the really basic things and ice packs. So that they actually have a, you know, refrigerators and you know, a little freezer so we could make some ice packs. But I'm finding them putting them on the bellies. And it's like, that's not going to work. So that's actually why I created that little drawing to, to illustrate to them it's over the big pipes. Because why? What happens when we perceive cold? The periphery, the little vessels all constrict. Right? So when I did this, they went, oh. <laughs> Okay, except the ice packs and the axilla really screws up taking your temperature. <laughs> when that's the only way to take temperature. Um, other things that we use are a variety of blankets, air circulating or water circulating blankets, water circulating gel pads, cooling helmets. And then we have one of my favorite things, because this is something that's universal, is iced ivy saline. And depending on how cold that saline is will depend on how aggressive it will drop the temperature. And it's been shown to be safe even in pre-hospital arenas, post-cardiac arrest. You know, so it's really easy to do. Stick it in the, the freezer, except for refrigerator, don't freeze it. I actually have seen it that way and then we used it as an ice pack first. <laughs> You know, you have to be creative sometimes. You know, then you have, um, we have a variety of intravascular cooling devices, heart-lung machines. You know, so when they do cardiac folks cool their patients using the heart-lung machine. 
hemofiltration um, can cool patients, ice gastric lavage. I've used that quite a bit too recently. And then there are some new uh, devices that are transnasal evaporative uh, cooling devices. So what about hypothermia? <laughs> Well, you know, when we talk about hypothermia, and we talked a little bit about this, there are some very specific things that we see in our patients as we cool them. And so I think we have a talk tomorrow about uh, Everest, isn't that right, climbing? So think about some of this when these mountain climbers are climbing. And, that, and, and what happens to us? So as our temperature gets to 30 six degrees, um, we start to see an, an increase in the attempt of, to warm our body. So think about yourself if you're out in the cold weather. What do you do as soon as you start getting cold? You start shivering, right? And so we get muscles tense and stuff in order to try to conserve the heat. We use those large muscles to generate heat. I think I always think my hands and feet immediately become pale, numb, and waxy <laughs> because I'm always cold. And then some people have, have disease that makes that even worse. So that's our initial things. Then as we get a little bit cooler, what we see is that we have uncontrolled shivering. Once we get to around 35 degrees, we really shiver because our body's trying hard to warm up. We're still pretty alert, but at that point, we're not very coordinated with our movements. Not a good thing for a mountain climber. Um, and we may have pain and discomfort in, in those extremities from the coldness. As we really get cold, 31 to 33 degrees, the shivering stops. We get to around 31, 32, no more shivering because our body can't really warm up. The muscles are tight. Now we start to see changes in our neurologic status. We really are starting to have confusion. This is why people walk off cliffs, you know, in the mountains. Um, the apathy, they have trouble communicating. Uh, they have, start to see changes in their breathing, shallow, slow breathing. And then below 31 is where you can see these are all our neurologic changes. We start to really, our skin's ice cold, we're weak, and we go on to the potential of having a respiratory and cardiac arrest. So that leads me to talk about shivering. So you've already heard, you know, shivering is actually most common during induction or rewarming. And it's around that 35 degrees where we start to shiver. And as we get down there to that 31, by the time we are there, we, we stop shivering. So it's not any help anymore, and our metabolic rate has dropped too far. When we shiver, though, we actually increase the metabolic rate up to four times. So since we're trying to protect the brain, shivering is actually making things worse, right? So it's, it's making the brain work harder, and we're trying to get, we're using more energy. And so we've just defeated what we're trying to do if we're trying to control the temperature or make them hypothermic. So we want tools to identify shivering before we get to this you know, that, that rigorous shivering. And so tools like this, the bedside shivering assessment, is helpful for us to identify when the patients are shivering. And we're looking at, like, mild shivering are micro. They're very small, so we have to sometimes look very closely to identify that the patient is shivering. And that's going to dictate what kinds of things we're going to do to manage that shivering. So we have both non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic methods of warming the patients. And I love this, you know, something so simple as putting gloves and socks on our patients can help our patients a little bit. And certainly, um, I know for myself, if I'm out in the cold, I need to be sure if my hands and feet are warm, I feel okay. And our sensors are in the periphery. We also can use counter-warming devices. So convection air um, 
blowing warm air is helpful around the, especially around the face. There are a number of pharmacologic agents that we can use. And there's, there's no absolute. There are a couple of them that you will see as we, we go along, things like magnesium that may actually have a dual role of why we, get, we might use magnesium. It's gonna help with shivering, but it's also gonna help with some of the flux of the electrolytes, magnesium, um, that happens. So this just to get, shows you, so imperidine, Demerol has been a drug that's been used for shivering, especially in anesthesia, for ye years, decades. And if we take a look at the doses of uh, meperidine, what you see is that it definitely, the larger the dose, the more it's gonna shut down the shivering. It also is gonna have somewhat of an effect on the vasoconstriction, but doesn't really do anything for our sweating. So this is actually a, a protocol for treating shivering using the, the shivering scale um, and what is done at one institution. So this is at Columbia. So you can see when there's no shivering, this is, this is where they start. So they have acetaminophen, buspirin. They start giving the patient some uh, magnesium and they start um, skin counter warming me me methods. Um, they add dextomidine, then they add opiates, uh, and the deeper they get, they put it propofol, and then they add a um, paralytic in the severe cases. So it's a tiered approach. If I can get it under control with the least um, invasive, the least um, complex pharmacologic agents, then that's pre preferable. So when we talk about hypothermia, there's basically three phases of hypothermia, and you've sort of heard us talking about the rewarming phase. But so we have the induction phase. And one of the interesting things, as Lori talked about, is we don't really know what is the right target of temperature at this point when we're talking about hypothermia. They, there's a large range in the literature of what people have used. The second phase is the maintenance phase. That's also variable in studies. You know, how long do we keep them cold? You know, is it 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, or is it days? Then we have the rewarming, and that's the time to normothermia. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then one of the keys that we have learned is that after they're rewarmed, maintaining normothermia, not having fever, because that's gonna negate any benefit that we just had. So here's an example of a protocol, again, during the induction phase. So this was for neuroprotection. Starting out with that iced IV saline, works really well, it gets things started in the right direction. Then we add some other um, advanced technology of your choice, um, and that we then start to look at, do I need to give uh, paralytics in order to uh, control the shivering, but also remembering I'm still gonna give some sedation as well. Then the maintenance phase is in some of the more sophisticated systems, you can actually see how active that cooling device is in trying to maintain that temperature. Because one of the things that may happen, if I've induced hypothermia, I still may have an underlying fever working. And so if that machine or the technology that's working with you is working really hard and it's telling you it's working really hard, you know that something else is going on in the background. Still need to monitor the, with the shivering. And then we're, we're also going to add paralytics as needed. When we get to the rewarming phase, as we had said before, this is really with a critical period. This is where we have problems, is if we rewarm them too fast, we may end up with increased intracranial pressure. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but that rewarming phase may take us a day or two. No active rewarming, passive rewarming. And um, then, it's suggested that probably at least 
up to 24 to 48 hours, maybe longer, to maintain active normothermia. So there's a number of things that happen um, to our bodies when we are inducing normothermia and when we're rewarming these patients. So there's a variety of electrolyte and hemodynamic things that happen. There's also a suppression of the immune system, making these patients much more susceptible to infection. And these are some of the challenges that we face when we're managing these patients. So if I have a decreased cardiac output and I don't have enough fluids in, this was one of the challenges with the NABISH studies, is that in the first NABISH study, they had a lot of hypotension. You know, and we know hypotension is bad. It worsens outcome uh, with head injury. So as we cool them, we initially get tachycardia, but quickly as they are being induced, they get bradycardia. We start to have a shift in the electrolytes. Potassium enters the cell. And so when we take our, our um, electrolytes, I have hypokalemia. So we often rush to give the patient more potassium but we're gonna to have to be careful about that. The kidneys are not gonna be reabsorbing the electrolytes at a normal rate, and one in particular, why I highlighted uh, magnesium with shivering, is that ma uh, magnesium is inhibited. And this is a major factor for if the magnesium is too low, it's gonna to contribute to cardiac arrhythmias. We get hyperglycemia because of uh, in increased incident insulin resistance, and polyuria. And we see a relative coagulopathy, not an absolute, but because of decreased platelet fun function and mild decrease in the platelet count. So all of these things can lead us to a problem with coagulopathy. So we've said several times now, that the rewarming phase is the most critical. And the rate of rewarming is probably the critical factor of determining what's going to happen. If I'm too fast, I'm gonna have vasodilatation and hypotension. You know, and the patients that are, this is probably really critical in is those patients with mass lesions. So when we rewarm the patient, we just reverse all those things we just talked about. So the electrolytes that are, have been potassium in the cell are now released. So now our, if we gave too much potassium because of that low uh, K, all of a sudden we're gonna have hyperkalemia. Um, so we have to be very careful of how much we give those, those patients. You know, how much of the insulin, because what does insulin do to potassium? Drive it into the cell. Um, and then we also have to look at their acid-base balance because there is an alkaline shift. Our CO2 levels um, start to fall and the blood pH starts to rise. This is a place also where we don't have an answer of how to best manage it. So there is no guideline, well, if your K is at this point, you should give them potassium. It's institutional, you sort of have to finesse these numbers. So if you take a look at, at this slide, what you'll see is there's a wide range of numbers. We might start out about a third of a degree centigrade an hour, but, and I have no ICP issues, we can go. That's fairly aggressive in letting the temperature rise. But as soon as I have ICP problems, because I've got that vasodilatation, now I have to slow down the, the rewarming, or I might stop it altogether and try again in 12 hours, 24 hours. But we definitely don't want to have hyperthermia, and that's critical. So normothermia. And this, I thought, was an interesting study because the fact that we are suppressing the immune system and these patients are susceptible to having an infection, um, this group decided they'd take a look at what would happen if we gave them prophylactic antibiotics. Well, you know nowadays, recommendations, don't prophylax anybody. Treat the real infection. 
you know, you might give a single dose before a procedure of an antibiotic. But so in this population, because it was so critical, and these were cardiac arrest patients, they went ahead and did some prophylaxis. And if you take a look here, so this was the total number of patients, 40% developed, um, or 40, yeah, 40 percent developed um, pneumonia, and that was the most common cause of infection. Um, if they were receiving antibiotics, the dose went of the incidence went down to 12.6 versus 54.9 percent of the patients with pneumonia. So all well and good, it decreased the rate of pneumonia, but it didn't really improve the patient's outcomes. So giving it probably isn't going to really make a difference. So with all of these things that we've heard today, what do we know? Well, education about targeted temperature management is critical. It's going to take teamwork and protocols. Protocols taking the best evidence for the population that we have. You know, thinking about, you know, the new evidence that you heard today from Lori. Um, what's in the literature now, you know, and say, how do I want to manage my patients? Seems pretty clear that it, it, normothermia is good. Fever is bad. <laughs> and that um, hypothermia has its limitations. It may help to suppress secondary injury or limit secondary injury. Um, and it has benefit in some populations, so the cardiac arrest population, it's pretty clear at this point. It seems to be helping, changing the outcome in that population, but that's not universal. We still have a lot of questions about how to induce them, how quickly, how long do we keep them, is it going to be the same in all populations? Um, what happens, you know, there's still the question, if they were cold when they came in, do you rewarm them? Or you do let them warm on their own. So there are a lot of questions about what we, how we want to manage these patients. But more to come, I'm sure. Thank you.